It was a helicopter on fire and just broken half in the sky. Fire in the sky, heartbreak, heroics. And a demand for answers. We've been piecemealing parts for years to maintain the flight capability. The perspectives, the plan, public safety, and its costs. It's going to be a lot of work, but we've done it before. We'll do it again. What a difference a storm makes. Are you glad you didn't stay? Oh, absolutely. South Florida lessons from Idalia. What will you be spending on? A smart, compassionate, and future-ready budget. And how much is that bill? Beyond what people will pay is the values of a community. The budget heads to the vote. This is it. Under siege, neighbors in crisis. The situation has uh, gotten much, much, much uh, worse. Americans evacuated South Florida families on edge. She's only 18 and she can't even finish school because of all the shooting and all the raping. What is happening in Haiti and what's to come? The big news of the week, all live this week in South Florida. Good Sunday morning. I'm Glenna Milberg. Tomorrow will be a week since a Broward Sheriff's helicopter heading to a call caught fire and fell out of the sky in a catastrophe that killed a fire rescue captain on board and a woman asleep in her apartment below. The demand for answers is immediate and there are no answers yet this morning or until federal investigators complete their painstaking work. But as disasters so often do, this one prompted the kind of public scrutiny that unearths context and brings up questions. In this case, that includes a past report about, and the current workload of, the BSO Air Fleet and those first responders aboard. The Broward County Commission is headed into budget this week, and this will certainly be front and center. Broward Mayor Lamar Fisher will be presiding over that and is right here with us live at the table today for the first time live at the table. Thank so you, happy Glenna. to have you, Mayor. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for interrupting your Labor Day weekend for us. Much appreciated. Yes. Um, so uh, our thoughts and condolences, our hearts are with those families. First I do foremost. want to, to, to um, offer our prayers and thoughts to the Jackson family as well as the Wheaton family as well. Yes as they go through the, um, the burial of their loved ones. And also the prayers for our professional staff, our firefighters and paramedics, along with all law enforcement officers that are going through it the same as well, where they lost a loved one too. 100%, it is a very tough time. And this is a tough conversation to have and a very necessary one. Mm -hmm. And we, we don't, again, we don't have answers and this conversation is not gonna be about answers. But what happened last week really did focus public attention on not only BSO, but maybe all law enforcement, all, uh, all agencies, air fleets, aging, and, um, high maintenance equipment, people who work long hours. What did you and the commission know about that conceptually before Monday, if anything? Well, we had just gone through myself negotiating with the sheriff and both staff uh, of each team was negotiating the final budget for the sheriff were we able to work in his 70 plus positions he wanted and a $64 million increase in his budget. So this really had been conversation only, but last Monday it really hit home uh, to what we really need to look at in the present and in the future as well. How do we replace this aging aircraft, have a long-term plan to do it? And I know that each team is working towards that goal and have been, but this tragedy really stepped in the forefront. It really did, and, and sometimes paper and numbers just don't really put things on, on the priority list like it should. Now we know, and I'm sure you probably knew, but now the public knows that there's this report from 2017 commissioned by BSO, uh, by a consultant, and, it, and it, it really highlights 80 pages. There's a couple of things that really draw your attention. Um, one of them is that three out of four of these, these aircraft mm -hmm. were in operation. One had been in years worth of maintenance. Uh, aging helicopters that were past their replacement. The parts, according to this report, a lot of confusion about the parts and how old the parts were and where were the parts. And, and now that you have this in hindsight, it's really clear, unclear to the public 
whether this is still the case. So update us, if you know, mm -hmm. Is this still the case, or has the sheriff's office been able to really, you know, so so called get its act together when it comes to what the consultant said in 2017? Well, of course, I was not on the dais in 2017. Right, and, and so Gregory I, Tony was not the sheriff then either. Co co the correct. Yeah. So we have to look at at both plans of what we want to do for the future. Um, our budget incorporates for the sheriff to be able to maintain and operate the aircraft. Uh, he has specific Airbus folks who handle the mechanics side of it. And so obviously with some we get the National Transportation Safety Board's report, we actually will not know exactly what it is. The good news is that out of this is that we are able to be contacted by Airbus, by the sheriff, and we're able to hopefully secure one and possibly two aircraft within about a 180 day window. So that's breaking news. And the board will be voting on this on September the 7th to be able to immediately buy the first aircraft with the opportunity to buy the second. So, so theoretically, on Thursday, you will have the purchase of a new helicopter in hand. We will provide the funding for that purchase, yes. The board will make that determination. Oh, great. We love to break news on it, this program. It was, it was good news, and Sheriff <laughs> yeah, Tony uh, was immediately contacted by Airbus. That is his preferred aircraft, yeah. and it's an H-145, which is dual engines, and is completely modified for paramedic and for operations of such. You know, that, that was one of the things in the report that I found really interesting, was that Broward Sheriff's is using these helicopters for dual purpose, law enforcement, canvassing areas, chasing subjects, and for paramedic purposes, responding to gunshot victims, car wrecks, helping people. Dual purpose made these helicopters very heavy, heavier than they were supposed to be, logging a lot of hours. I think, um, and I want to talk about the June budget presentation, almost twice the hours logged before maintenance than they were supposed to be. So is one of the, the things that the Sheriff's Department wants to do is sort of bifurcate, get helicopters doing one or the other? Well, they do. They actually have two paramedic type aircraft and then they have three law enforcement aircraft. So those, those are bifurcated They now. are, yeah. The H-145s are the single engines. The H-140, excuse me, 125 is the single. The 145 is the dual and those are the paramedic types. So that was one of the things in the consultant's reports that I guess really came to fruition. That's, that's good news. Yeah. So in June, there was a budget pres presentation coming up to this week mm -hmm. and the sheriff presented um, sort of separate from his presentation for the budget, talked about a project they're working on. He put a $20 million price tag on that to double the number of aircraft, enhance the capabilities. He projected that the number of calls for these aircraft would double in three years. Is there $20 million for this project to take this into the future? Well, immediately on September the 7th, um, the aircraft that we're talking about purchasing is about a $15 million purchase. So immediately we will pay for that uh, if the board approves it. But in the future, again, we want to make sure that long-term plan, Glenda, is in place so we can have this aircraft replaced periodically so they're not aging anymore. And they do have the maintenance capabilities. They do have the warranties in place, whether it be through lease or whether it be through purchase. How is, frame for me, I, you know, you don't speak for other commissioners, certainly, no. and I've spoken to a couple of them this week, mm -hmm. um, and like you, knew all about the sort of headlines of what was going on, but never really realized that it's a now first priority kind of project. Correct. What is the sentiment, do you think, your perspective of the commission as a whole, when you meet Thursday, what do you expect? I expect the commission to really embrace this opportunity that we have. We have had our top priority is public safety, without a doubt. Our sheriff's budget is about 54, 55% of our existing entire budget. So we are committed to public safety. Is that, I don't want to interrupt you, is that normal? Is that a. It depends. A when number? I was at the city of Pompano Beach as mayor, it was about 45%. So, but increasing cost, yeah. obviously, we deal with. But at the end of the day, I believe our board is very, very persistent on public safety, and I can't predict how they vote, but I'm sure the majority will be in favor of purchasing this aircraft and then working on the purchase of other aircraft. And then there is the personnel issue, because according to the Sheriff's Department, the people who are, I mean, this is specialized mm. kind of activity, and people are working long hours. 
especially that you know there's the paramedic side there's the law enforcement side mm -hmm. people with those special abilities they are working the kinds of shifts that are difficult and challenging for for human physiology um, personnel costs have to be part of that they do and my understanding that the the sheriff's budget already has two full-time mechanics that are trained for this aircraft and maintenance of that. And I believe he might be looking for more now as he increases his fleet. But we make sure that those dollars are there for him to be able to have those maintenance problems that they can be corrected immediately. And if they're not, down the aircraft until it is completed and then move it forward. You know, this is a, a, such a big issue at the moment, and I know just a, this much part of the entire county budget that you and your colleagues will be working on. Again, I so appreciate your time on this holiday weekend, coming in, sitting here, really being upfront about um, what you're facing. Much appreciated. Thank you, Glenna, very much. Thank you. And next, in the path of Idalia, the president promising long-term disaster assistance, and live from Tallahassee today, emergency workers with Adalia's Lessons for South Florida. Stay tuned. <music> President Biden committed to long-term disaster assistance this weekend as he and the First Lady got a first-hand look at Hurricane Idalia's aftermath. Idalia stormed ashore the Gulf Coast as a Cat 3 this week, and as of today, 13 Florida counties are included in a major disaster declaration. Miami Dade and Broward and Monroe are not among them. We dodged it this time, but the two latest eye storms, Ian and Idalia, have current and critical lessons for South Florida. On the ground for both, FEMA's Federal Coordinating Officer, Brett Howard, joining us today from Tallahassee. Brett Howard, welcome to the program. Thank you, ma'am. I'm glad to be here. So I want to start right off the bat with, from our point of view, one of the clearest lessons of this storm that we could see from afar is the effect of successful evacuations. And I wonder if you would sort of, from the ground there, Tell us what, what you saw, how people really did heed the call for evacuations and what a difference that made. Uh, I have to agree with you. Uh, looking at from the onset of the storm, when the meteorologists at the Hurricane Center and the National Weather Service forecast office, along with the local meteorologists, identified this storm really early. And we started, we're able to start making preparations a lot earlier than you would normally see a Gulf storm, uh, which allowed the local officials uh, to to really hammer home the threat. Uh, the Hurricane Center nailed the forecast. It, they were exactly right. It went where they, they thought it was going to go with the impacts. So that allowed the local first responders and the local elected officials and along with the state officials to really hammer home that message that you need to evacuate and what appropriate actions to take. And the most important, as you just said, was that people actually heeded the evacuation. We didn't see the, a tremendous loss of life. There was loss of life, which is always, always um, really bad, but you didn't see it like you did in I, Ian, and that's, the, and that's really good. We're really pleased that it, it actually appears people did take responsibility and do what they needed to do to protect themselves and their families. You know, let me talk a little bit about what you just said. Um, the Hurricane Center nailed the predictions, nailed the cone. That is, you know, usually the case is they're pretty accurate, but the storm itself is always at the end unpredictable. So when, yes. when lay people and residents of any particular area are watching and waiting, do you think that this this time, unlike Ian in Adalia, nobody really knew how accurate it was going to be, just like in hurricanes past. Um, so, so what was it this time that that people decided to go? I wish I could answer that question. Um, I think the past, right? You you look at what happened with Hurricane Ian, and people saw what happens when you don't and just not willing to take the chance. This was a really fast moving storm. Uh, you didn't experience the high velocity winds uh, for a, a, an extreme amount of time. 
it was it was hours. It wasn't a day, and it, it when it spun up, it it strengthened very quickly and it moved very rapidly. So the it it allowed us to and I, the forecast in in my layman's terms, it, it didn't move that much like you saw with with Ian and it wobbling back and forth. This pretty much stayed on the track and did what the Hurricane Center expected it to do. As it strengthened, it's going to move northwest and it did and it and we had enough time to to prepare and people did it and i couldn't be more pleased with the efforts from the locals in the state to to get the message out and people acted and i think it's from looking at ian and what happened there just a short we're coming up on a one-year anniversary september 28th of last year that was a so fast still year huh? that felt like a fast yeah, it year. has been so as we, I know you can't see the video that we're looking at, and as, as we're talking, you in Tallahassee can't see this, but we were looking at some pretty horrifying video of the aftermath of Adalia, including major storm surge flooding, fires, I mean, destroyed homes, real damage, lo a loss of life so minimal as, as you were saying, so that's a good part. But this is, the, this is an area of the state that is fairly rural, suburban rural. It's not like Miami-Dade or Fort Lauderdale, uh, big major buildings. What can extrapolate for us if you can? Had, had a Dahlia been in a different course, um, what would have, South Florida's danger would have been more of the storm surge and less than the wind. And that's kind of what we keep hearing. Do you, do you see that, that this case might have been just like that? Uh, yes, take this storm and put it anywhere else in Florida and you have a totally different outcome. Uh, the, you, you've got the, the, the shelf there in the Gulf. You've got different topographical issues. You've got a major population. Uh, you have a lot of trees and, and uh, a big canopy there that can help with the wind. You get to South Florida and it's, it's, it's open, it's buildings. It's, it's a totally different storm anywhere else in Florida. And, and so thank goodness it didn't come here, I guess. It's what everyone saw right now. The um, state and federal unified command that you are working with, uh, that would be along with Florida's Division of Emergency Management, uh, Kevin Guthrie as the director who's been on this program. Right now, we understand you are still in search and rescue status. Is that true? Uh, we finished up uh, the federal requirement for search and rescue uh, was completed yesterday. And I think the state has pretty much completed their their search and rescue efforts today. Uh, and so we're really toward at this point moving into recovery as we have our staff on the ground and, and meeting with survivors and trying to connect them with federal assistance. The response piece outside of the, the electrical, outside of the um, getting power restored, but the search and rescue pieces we have completed. And I think there's a Miami's and Miami-Dade's search and rescue teams are there. I guess that they would be working under the auspices of the state. I know they were part of that effort. Yes, the state has, the state of Florida has a very robust search and rescue network throughout the state. I think they have uh, as many as eight teams that are highly qualified uh, for search and rescue and building collapse and, and those specialties. And where, where this storm was, they were able to activate most every one of those teams, if not every one, and bring them uh, to Tallahassee, to the area of impact to start. So the, it was minimum support from the federal government, but we still employed six uh, federal search and rescue assets to assist them. So it was quite a large search and rescue operation uh, and the state did a, a tremendous job using what they have existing in the state. You know, I was reading, Mr. Howard, a little bit about your background and it's kind of stunning to see that you've been what they call the FCO, the FEMA's um, Federal Coordinating Officer for 21 presidential disasters. That's pretty stunning. And I wonder if from that perch, you can sort of give us some context as we head into what is the height of hurricane season here in Florida. What have you seen? What are your observations on any kind of trends, be it sea level rise or atmospheric? Do you, do you see any kind of trend coming that you can sort of observe for us? 
I I can't really speak on that. Uh, but what I can tell you is, as like you mentioned, I'm, my job is to be the federal coordinating officer, and it is my sole focus to fun, to focus on helping the state of Florida right now, and and being able to be here before, during, and after disasters. And that is my focus: is helping these survivors. Uh, and we're, well, you're right. We're in the middle of hurricane season and we're in the height of hurricane season. The season is not over. It is so important that people don't let their guard down. We've had one and that's all. It only takes one to be a bad hurricane season. The predictions can be what they are. But when you have one hurricane, it's a bad season and, um, and it's not over. So everybody needs to stay alert, be prepared. And if you aren't, if you're not sure what to do, go to uh, our website uh, at FEMA that we've got a really lot, a lot of good information on there at disasterassistance.gov. If you need to, to register. Uh, we actually, we actually have all of that right on our website. We make it very easy. We are so on board with you on getting people prepared. So we have all of that readily available to our viewers. Brett Howard, so appreciate your time. I know you are so busy up there and we are very grateful that you spent a couple of minutes with us today. Thank you. It's my pleasure. All right, Thank take you, care. And right, up next, how will Miami-Dade be spending your money? The mayor has a plan and she's live with us next. A yearly ritual which ha happens to coincide with the height of hurricane season. County budgets. Miami-Dade, Broward and Monroe counties are all in the thick of it, looking at what is coming in and deciding how to spend it and how much more it will cost you to do that. Some people do concert tours. Miami-Dade Mayor Daniela Levine Cava does the budget tour and is joining us <laughs> via Zoom. Good morning, Mayor, or good afternoon, I suppose. How are you? Very well. Thank you so much for having me. Busy. Busy leading up to Thursday's budget hearing. And when you first presented this budget in July, we were there. Um, and what was sort of a headline that I took from this was, aside from the meat and potatoes, funding police and fire and garbage and transportation, this is an investment type budget. And I wonder if you would expand on that a bit. Yeah, thanks, Glenna. So true. We are making up for deferred maintenance, uh, kicking the can down the road for too long. For example, our water and sewer system, which has been under federal court review for quite some time and with the aggressive schedule of infrastructure repairs that we're making, over a billion dollars that was spent in my administration towards a huge capital improvement plan, uh, bringing down a billion dollars of federal and state discretionary grants, we're, re, we're rebuilding, retooling, whether it's transit, elevators, escalators, uh, uh, parks, all facilities, of those things all kinds. That have been in the news. Let, let me ask you, as long as you brought that up, why has the can been kicked down the road? Has it been a money thing? Has it been ad administrative <clears throat> oversight? Get, get a little bit real with us about that. Why has the can been kicked down the road? I think people tend to look at these things year by year and in general, nobody likes to pay increased fees or, or taxes, of course. And by the way, I have reduced taxes in my proposed budget for the second year in a row. And this is the lowest tax level since 1982. So we've been able to make all of these investments while also providing much needed savings uh, for our, our residents who are struggling with the rising cost of living. Uh, but I do think that um, it's been easier to say we'll get to this another day somebody, on somebody else's watch. And we are very fortunate that our economy has recovered so strongly and that the federal government has invested. So we have really an opportunity to, to make good on many, many years of delayed and deferred maintenance. So let, let's talk about that math a little bit because I know that you will be going to a commission where there are gonna be people saying, hey, we are flush with money this year, we're doing really well, we've got federal money to spend, to your point, using that to do things that haven't been possible in years past, but there, you know, are gonna be some commissioners who say, well, you know, property tax is 1% uh, lower is 
great, but let's make it 3% lower because property values are rising, which means that even with the tax cut, there are going to be you know, countless homeowners who are going to be paying more next year, even with the tax cut. So what will you be saying to those commissioners who say, let's cut more? For sure, we want to be sure to, to provide real savings. And at the same time, people want service. So this budget does preserve the same level of service. It does not enhance our service. So people want their police and fire and, and garbage, yes, uh, roads, libraries, parks. That is all on the agenda. And fortunately, we haven't had to make cuts to those essential services. So I think uh, we also have new mandates from the state. We have these constitutional offices coming online. These are going to be expensive. We have to plan a transition. We've got more than 5,000 employees that would be transitioning to these new constitutional offices. And there's a lot of planning and um, uh, savings that we need to be sure to have in place uh, for, for those new offices. And we've also had to increase uh, our um, retirement savings for our county employees by state law, which comes all out of the county coffers. And of course, things cost more. They cost more for everybody. They cost more for us. So I think it would it would be wonderful if we could reduce further. But we think this is balanced, responsible, compassionate, people first. And on the circuit, I have to tell you, people have been very happy with what we've told them. You have been doing town halls. You've been taking public input. I, I'm going to guess that a lot of people in the public don't realize how many unfunded mandates the state has been handing down to local governments. That, yeah, a lot and a significant amount. I, I want to talk about, just real quickly, I know some the albatross around the neck of every local government in South Florida is affordable housing. And yes. I know Miami-Dade has various programs. Uh, I wonder, in this budget, what is done to address, because affordable housing means means rent and purchase, but it also means the cost of insurance and taxes. Yeah. And that has you know, from our vantage point here in news, just untenable for too many people. Absolutely. Glenna, I was an advocate before I was elected and housing was always top of my agenda. So I've been on this for decades and I'm so grateful that this commission voted last year uh, to follow my proposed plan, the Homes Plan, which invests in multiple ways to help homeowners and tenants. 32,000 units of affordable and workforce housing and the pipeline subsidies to uh, those who can't afford their rent, uh, $50,000, up to $50,000 grants for condo owners who can't afford to pay those special assessments for repairs, zero interest loans for 30 years, um, maintaining affordable housing. We give grants to uh, small landlords who agree to keep their rents affordable. It increased money for uh, rental assistance to prevent um, evictions. We've saved 25,000 plus households from being evicted and also legal services to assist them to negotiate with landlords to uh, maintain uh, their, their homes. So uh, one of the biggest programs provides specifically for increased insurance. It's $1,500 per household for expenses like increased insurance, but we are asking the commission to give us permission to go up to 3,500 per household because we've seen the prices skyrocketing. And we know that that so many, so many are, are struggling to and, keep pace with these costs. Yeah, and I, I remember like for the last couple of years, that is the A number one topic for every elected official from Key West to Boca, it seems like. Um, real quickly, Mayor, you know, we're heading into campaign season as you go to the commission on seven. Not that this is not a partisan subject for every year, but particularly this year. And I know you said that you took your budget, you've been meeting with commissioners. What kind of support do you expect to get Thursday for this? I think our commission recognizes that we must balance. People want to have county services. They don't want cutbacks. I think they realize that a tax a cut in millage is a very good thing. And we also uh, know that they, uh, they have investments in parks that they're able to make. That is a primary one. So stay, <laughs> stay tuned 
to some improvements in parks. We have parks infrastructure money in the budget and these commissioners have great plans for our community. So those are some of the priorities and I'm very hopeful I'll have the support to pass the budget. Um, well, we've I just, worked hard. I, I want everyone to know that your whole budget proposal is right there on our website. Anyone who wants to kick back on Labor Day weekend and read it all, it's all right there for them to read. Mayor, thanks very much for being with us today. Thank you, Glenna, always. And up next, unrest in Haiti, a rise in gang violence, massacres, travel warnings in place. Miami Herald's Caribbean reporter Jackie Charles joins us with her unique perspective on this crisis right here. Stay tuned. Gang rule, massacres in the streets, a police force overrun, and an international community struggling to help Haiti's deepening crisis. Midweek, the State Department advised Americans to leave Haiti. American Airlines began sending larger capacity airlines to accommodate those, anyone, with the means to do so, including those with families in South Florida. Few journalists know Haiti better than Jackie Charles, Miami Herald's Caribbean reporter who's been covering Haiti, the people, the government, the issues through the last decades. I know you're not that old, but <laughs> you've been covering it a long time. I have to. And, um, and we are very grateful for the perspective that you provide. You know, we, uh, I guess when I say we, the public, it began sort of focusing in on this massacre recently in Canaan, where parishioners and a pastor were literally protesting gang rule and were slaughtered in the streets. What has, how, how has this blown up into this crisis? Well, exactly. When you look at Canaan, which is on the outskirts of Port-au-Prince, we have to go back to 2010, the earthquake. earthquake. And you remember we had General Kelly, we had Sean Penn, they were there, they were saying, we need to remove the people off the golf course. We need to provide housing for the quake victims. And so this was a land that which, was- Which wasn't wrong. Yeah, which wasn't wrong, <laughs> was but wrong. It, this was a land that was empty. The government yeah. was forced to, you know, turn it over. Um, but, you know, Haiti's dysfunctional government works very slow. People went in there, there was no infrastructure, there was nothing. And we were saying, like, this is going to be larger than most Haitian cities, over 300,000. And I remember, like, I did the anniversary piece 10 years after the earthquake, and we could not go to that community because of gangs. But it wasn't this bad. And I think that when you look at that area, you look at how, you know, the gangs had started to move in, um, and people were just sort of ignoring it and thinking maybe it's going to go away. And today you have a situation where more than 80% of Port-au-Prince, today the concern, people's homes are being set on fire. 10,000 people have been forced out in the last two weeks alone. 70 people have been killed. And there is fear, real fear, that Port-au-Prince, all of it is going to fall under gang control. Where, where do these gangs get their weapons and what do they want? What is the end game? Well, it depends on the gang. I mean, then the weapons are coming from South Florida. Um, you know, and it's not just Haiti, it's throughout the, the, the Caribbean. I mean, we spoke to um, folks in the uh, Biden administration, uh, Jay Weaver and I, and they basically said that at least 50% of their cases today are the illegal shipment of arms to the Caribbean. Um, it's not Mexico anymore. Wow. And um, and depending on the gangs, I mean, the, this what you're seeing in Cafufe, which is a community in Port-au-Prince, what people are telling us is that the gangs want access to kidnapping routes, that the police did manage to shut down one of their kidnapping routes. They want control of this hilltop community, which will allow them to spread out, which would allow them to move kidnap victims because this is how they're getting their money. And a, a lot of people in South Florida with families in Haiti, they have been on the front lines of this where they've had to come up with tens of thousands thousands of dollars to secure the release of their loved ones. And where is the government, it, which is essentially in turmoil on its own yes. since the assassination of Joe You have a government President that's Joe collapsed, Benham. it's not elected, you have no elected officials in this country. Is the, And the, the international community, which has been in Haiti for decades, not always successfully, where, what kind of help? should the international community and the United States be providing? Well, right now the United States Embassy is, is 
on the front lines of, of, of the firing. I mean, they are hearing the, the gunshots. They basically put in shelter in place orders for those people that are there. They've been working in terms of trying to get a multinational force. Kenya said, okay, we'll consider this. But I wrote recently how they went to Haiti and they basically stayed close to the airport. They didn't even go into Port-au-Prince. Um, we're hearing that they are now, after we wrote our story about a static force, they're reconsidering what kind of mandate. But there's also a lot of discussions and debate about that. Do you and Security Council um, people are watching it very closely to see if they will authorize some sort of a resolution for a force to go in and to assist the Haitian National Police. But it needs much more than just a police intervention. They're really, because you kill one gang member and there are dozens of others who are already in this gang who are ready to take over. You really have to deal with the developmental issues and what's forcing this. And, and take us down that road, the developmental issues. What is forcing this? Well, you have a situation where you have huge inequality in a country, of a country today where more, almost half of your population can't find enough to eat. So you have a humanitarian crisis. You have the economy that's in shambles. As I mentioned, not one elected official. So you have a constitutional crisis. You have a political crisis. Nothing's working in the country. And so you go in and you help the police which I just reported 800 police officers that have left this force that only has 3,300 officers on public safety duty on any given day. They, they feel outgunned they and overwhelmed. Outgunned, overwhelmed. They're, yeah. being, they're coming here under this new humanitarian parole program. You have hundreds of gangs. So if you go in and you manage to bring the situation in Port-au-Prince under control, don't you think that the gangs will probably move outside of Port-au-Prince? So you need to invest in those communities to shore up. We talked about Kana'a and what happened. That was a vigilante justice. We saw this starting in April, where Haitians could not depend on the government, could not depend on the police, and they decided to take matters into their own hands. Over 300 people have been killed, according to the UN, because of these public lynchings led by the population. Um, but now we see the gangs exacting revenge. They're Pu turning public, back. Public lynchings of gang members? Suspected gang members. But in there, we know of at least one police officer who was killed because they thought that he was a gang member. So when the public takes the justice into their own hands and they become, you know, jury and convictor, you have no idea who, you know, who you're killing. But this was a population that says, we see the gangs are coming into our communities. We cannot lose our communities. We need to fight back. And while they had some success, you see now church members deciding that they're going to go take on a vicious, dangerous gang. And we cannot tell you nor can the police tell you how many people were killed last weekend in this massacre and that was that, that was the the parishioners yes who with were this pastor killed. you know it, it's not lost on a lot of people um, immigration here as a whole in the US is just such a really contentious and controversial yes. issue um, no easy answers but right now and is as mo most recently Thursday, there were plane loads of Haitian nationals deported from the U.S. back to Haiti because they were here illegally under the Biden administration rules. And it's, it's really not lost on the question, how do you deport people back to a country where you, your State Department is telling people to get out? They're telling Americans to get out and they're deporting Haitians back in. And we've asked this question and basically the administration response is that, well, since January, we have vetted and approved over 63,000 Haitians under this Biden humanitarian parole program and over 50,000 have arrived, and, you know, but that they're going to continue to enforce the immigration laws of the United States. At the same time, if Haiti continues to deteriorate, we can probably think that we're going to see an increase in boats leaving either trying to get through the Florida Strait or through Puerto Rico from you know the Dominican side which is you know the neighbor of Haiti and so that crisis is it's, it's real what's happening. Jackie Charles your perspective is amazing I know are you traveling there? I was, re I, I was recently okay. there and we we're watching the situation closely at the Miami Herald and we will decide when we need to go back in. But every single day I'm writing about Haiti right. and so I invite people to read our coverage. Yeah, and uh, we all as a South Florida news organization, I think everybody has a real personal stake in covering yes. this too. Thank you so much, appreciate it all. Thank you for having me. Up next, to the Florida Keys, where tributes continue to pour in for music icon Jimmy Buffett, his life, his legacy, remembered by so many who knew him personally. Of all the people and places remembering Jimmy Buffett, the Florida Keys is above and beyond the place that made him and that made he made in return. 
The pirate who looked at 40 found his lost shaker assault is no doubt enjoying a cheeseburger in paradise and in paradise Janine Stanwood right there live with sometimes the best job on earth, the de facto Keys Bureau Chief. Sometimes it is. Good morning. <laughs> good afternoon. Good morning. That's it. At good afternoon, we should say. You know, sometimes in the Keys, the line between morning and afternoon is blur, right? <laughs> so Five o'clock somewhere. This we have talked about has somewhere, exactly. <laughs> this place has been a tourist destination for a long time, even before Jimmy Buffett decided to make this place home in the early 1970s. But as we've talked about, he really, really encapsulated and captured that Florida Keys vibe, and he did a really good job marketing it as well. He also inspired a lot of other artists, including Kenny, Kenny Chesney, who we can tell you is actually in town as we speak. I want to show you video from yesterday. There he was on a beach. It might have been Smathers. Uh, he was playing that song, Glenna. He was playing a Pirate Looks at 40, his tribute to Jimmy Buffett. So many tributes, especially here in the Florida Keys, from people who knew him best. We could laugh, we would all Jimmy Buffett, who perfected that beach bum island sound, is being celebrated here in the Florida Keys. From Captain Tony's, where he got his start on stage, the chart room, where he played for drinks, and his old recording studio by the water, where a memorial grows. Oh my gosh, Margaritaville? That really did help put Key West on the international travel map, as well as the rest of the Florida Keys. Earlier this summer, we talked to Jack Spotswood, who was Buffett's landlord when he moved to Key West in the early 70s. He rented um, the apartment right next door to me, and so that's where you, you see the on the A1A album. Jimmy moved in over top of me. Chris Robinson lived there too, and says they became fast Wish friends. That was, uh, <laughs> was the best place, the six houses in Key West on the water, and we lived in one of them. We got together and and started fishing. Fred Troxel was a longtime fishing buddy and says Buffett paid for the band at his wedding, then gave a surprise performance. Many of them were shocked that he was there and, and then the ones that left early because they were, you know, short hitters and didn't party late, uh, then they were like, oh, damn, I missed that. Of course, as we pay homage to Buffett. And Tributes on the radio throughout the island chain have been pouring in. You see it all. Jimmy Buffett laid a, a blueprint for myself and a lot of the guys and gals that are down here, either working on the water or you came down for the week and you never went home. In Buffett wasn't just a songwriter, he was a savvy businessman, using his celebrity for causes, like restoring the old Miami Marine Stadium. He joked with us in 2014, his memories of playing there were hazy. I'm trying to come up with them right now, they were kind of foggy, but I think I'll it's a surprise. Let me go. I gotta go Jimmy, do it. Quick. Illness forced Buffett to reschedule concerts in May. Sources say he had cancer. Late Friday, official word he died at the age of 76, surrounded by loved ones. In our hearts and in our minds, and in this fate of mine, Jimmy Buffett will always live on. So that video from 2014, Glenna, I actually was the one who was interviewing Jimmy Buffett. I remember that day so, so clearly. He was sort of uh, being handled by a bunch of PR people who wanted him to move on. Understandably, they had a schedule that they wanted to keep. But he saw us. He saw the reporters. We were all standing there like puppies with our microphones, like, please talk to us. And he did. He came <laughs> over. He was uh, very kind. He gave us just those few words, which was fine, but he knew we wanted it. And when I spoke to his old roommate and I talked to people uh, who, who knew him well, the fishing buddy, they would go fishing every single year. They said, yeah, he, he did. He became a billionaire, but he was always generous. He was always gracious and they're going to miss him. And tonight here in Key West, there will be a procession at five o'clock and we'll be there. That's so amazing. And you know, in the last 24 hours, I've realized everybody has a Jimmy Buffett story. Everyone. Janine, great to no have doubt. you. No doubt. No doubt. Thank, thanks for being on board with us today. All right, we, my pleasure. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Great to have you aboard this hour. Have a beautiful holiday weekend. And remember, get online and get in touch.